what about disinformation, misinformation, malinformation? I, I mean, I don't even know exactly what malinformation is, but um, what do you think it's ever acceptable for a platform to do this, or is it just free speech and everything should be acceptable, right? That it that isn't illegal. Yep. But even that, right? Even that. I mean, these are questions I'm asking myself. Mm -hmm. I'm horrified by some of the um, like child exploitation stuff, the porn, some some of the stuff that's kind of rampant on some of the um, some of these platforms, the the biggest platforms, right? Yep. So. No, no, I don't want that stuff there. <laughs> On the other hand, right, isn't it, you can't you just pass laws to make whatever it is that you feel like you want to be illegal, illegal, and all of a sudden, yeah, hey, it's illegal to, to say, you know, very, what, what a year ago were very basic things, right? Yeah. Is it ever acceptable? I, I definitely think it's acceptable. Um, but the problem is tech companies have taken it too far. And this is where you get into the Section 230 of the 1996 Communications Decency Act, a reform of that specific statute. We're thinking, OK, there's an otherwise objectionable clause that basically protects community or uh, tech companies from civil liability. It gives them immunity from civil liability if they remove speech and content uh, based off of um, a bunch of, you know, Tightly defined things, and then they say an otherwise objectionable content. And tech companies have really taken that and run with it, and used it to sort of censor all kinds of political viewpoints and whatnot. So they've they've been given an inch and they've taken a mile. Uh, however, when it comes to and this is how I sort of parse it out: state linked disinformation and influence operations. Granted, attribution is very very difficult, ex especially when these state linked actors deliberately outsource uh, the purveying of this disinformation to you know regular citizens to fringe news outlets that then pass it to some trusted outlets. So it's a it's a very I would say almost an intractable problem, but companies, I think, need to focus more on those sorts of things. And that's when, you know, purging sort of genuine state linked bad actor, foreign actor, uh, foreign disinformation is is a good thing. I think that they need to start there. And I do think it, it originally did start there, but it just, as you said, metastasized into something very, very different. And that was, you know, with the Hunter Biden laptop story, again, the uh, Wuhan um, Institute of Virology lab leak uh, theory and, and whatnot. I think they've they've basically taken that charge, which was originally a noble charge, and and gone too far because they don't pay a cultural price for this. You know, they don't pay a cultural price for uh, purging Marjorie Taylor Greene off of Twitter. They don't pay a cultural price for purging Representative Jim Banks or suspending him or you know Rand Paul or taking down a Clarence Thomas documentary from Amazon. Uh, Right now, yes, the public is catching wind and they're saying, OK, this might be a problem, but you have accusations that all of these things are they're, they're anecdotal. And but I say, believe your lying eyes. All of these mistakes are, are going in one direction. And we're starting to have studies coming out of organizations that are saying, yeah, conservatives and people who support Republican politicians and Republican Congress members themselves, they are, in fact, treated differently on these platforms. But, you know, to date, uh, this is pretty much it. It hasn't necessarily flown under the radar, but it's not really affecting their bottom line. You know, their stock prices keep going up and up and up. So until they actually pay a price for this wanton censorship, uh, companies are going to keep doing what they're doing. And I think it's very important to note that it's not just confined to social media companies either. And we talked about this a little bit in the beginning with Airbnb denying services to Michelle Malkin because of her you know, incendiary viewpoints. But it's coming at Spotify now, which is a media services company, not even headquartered in the US. It's coming at uh, GoFundMe, you know, or they're they're instituting it themselves. Um, these are online fundraising platforms. Kickstarter has done it before, too, when it comes to um, anti-abortion and pro-life content um, that are that's being advertised on their platforms. So it's it's hitting every node of your digital life, which is extremely problematic because we're going to be hemmed in more and more anyone, you know, not just conservatives, but people 
with heterodox views or, you know, people with heterodox views tomorrow because we don't know what's going to be considered um, against whatever is the prevailing narrative tomorrow. It changes so suddenly and so fast. But I think the GoFundMe point is, is particularly interesting okay. because you have a company that with the Kyle Rittenhouse saga, again, they actively denied contributions to Kyle Rittenhouse's legal defense fund because pretty much Kyle set himself in opposition to BLM and all of its its protests and, and its motivations. Um, so they said nobody can donate to him, yet they themselves donated hundreds of dollars to the rioters, to the, the BLM uh, protesters and people who were actively burning down buildings in Wisconsin. Now with um, the Canadian trucker convoy, um, so the Canadian truckers are, are in Ottawa right now. They're shutting down certain roads and whatnot to sort of pressure the government to, to drop its vaccine mandate for, for truckers. Uh, GoFundMe amassed 10 million Canadian dollars to distribute and help this convoy. And now they're saying, you know, we already distributed 1 million. We, they initially said they're going to take 9 million of those Canadian dollars and give it to verified charities of their own choice. People were like, no, there's a legitimate case for fraud here. So now they're going to say that they're distributing it to everybody. But bottom line... Distributing it back to oh, the yes, to sorry, users because that's their usual model. Precisely. Right? Precisely. Yeah. Um, instead of giving it to charities of their choice when they've already donated to BLM rioters and whatnot, which is problematic in and of itself. And the Ottawa government, GoFundMe is an American company, and the Ottawa government, Trudeau himself, said um, that they were working with GoFundMe to actually stop the distribution of uh, these finances to keep the trucker convoy going. That, I mean, we can't even voice, at, at this point, we can't even voice our, our opinion by donating money on these digital services. Um, it happens with email delivery services as well. It happens with internet service providers. They're taking down websites, refusing to host sites that have different political views than, you know, than those that conform to woke ideology, like, again, the, the pro-life stance. So I think this is, it's important for people to understand that it's not just social media companies or your right to be on Twitter, your right to be on Facebook. It's everything. Email delivery services, online fundraising platforms, your ability to, to get a creative project going, the regular person's ability to have a, a business on Instagram, um, your ability to sell merchandise that you create on Shopify, um, uh, your ability to bank online with Stripe. We know that 17 digital platforms mobilized within two weeks in early January to suspend or ban President Trump from their platforms. It can happen to the everyday user as well. So I think it, it's critical that we realize it's not just social media companies, but it's every aspect of your digital life, which is life into perpetuity. So what do you make of this new uh, DHS bulletin that focuses on, you know, basically focuses the agency's posture towards further countering of misinformation, disinformation, malinformation. I think it's that linking of disinformation with terrorism. And I think that these institutions, they have definitions for a reason. They call things terrorism for a reason because you can, once you label something terrorism, you can then mobilize the robustness of the entire U.S. national security apparatus developed in the wake of the September 11th attacks. And you can mobilize them against anyone that you're accusing of terrorism. And when you link disinformation, malinformation, misinformation with terrorism, that gives them license to do a variety of things under a variety of specialized authorities um, and visit them against the uh, purveyor of this disinformation or misinformation. What's extremely troubling is that definition is, is not tightly defined, right? You're not even talking necessarily about those state-linked actors I was talking about earlier. You're talking about people that are questioning the, uh, you know, what we're allowed to say about COVID today. And we we know that questioning the, the efficacy of cloth masks, again, questioning uh, wh where the origins of COVID, we knew that all of these things were one time considered misinformation. So anybody who, who does that as the science continues to change, are they now terrorists too? That to me is they're, they're, they're operating in a nebulous, opaque space on purpose. And that is to potentially normalize the use of those authorities against people with a specific uh, a thought pattern. 
Um, and even more troubling, I don't know if you remember, but uh, it, the creation of a new domestic terrorism unit under DOJ was announced recently, too. And the rationale for that was um, to target people who had anti-authority authority or anti-government ideologies.